So yeah, just um, continuing today, um, looking into the various jewels that we can find in the book of James. You may remember that the last time I got to speak, we looked into James 1 verse 2 to 4. I mentioned that James wasted no time and was out swinging early, admonishing us to count it all joy when we fall into different trials, temptations and tests. We spent a long time looking into the reason for them, what they could look like, what attitude to have while we're going through them, how to feel positive about them. Yes, be positive about them. With one of the end results being that we lack nothing, being perfected, remembering who it is that brings these tests upon us, who leads us into opposition and adversity, and most importantly, why. Today we will start off looking from verse 5 to 8, because these verses have so much to do with the previous 2 to 4, it will feel like we're going over some of what we previously have witnessed. Verse 5 starts with similar fervency to verse 2. But if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God. Note that this instruction follows, so that you may be perfect, entire, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God. It would need self-reflection, examination, to work out if we are lacking, if we possess or, or do not possess enough wisdom. Or, it's probably a safer bet just to realize that not many, if any, would not be in the dire need of more wisdom. Do you consider yourself to be wise? If so, is this wrong? Proverbs 3 verse 7 says, To us all, be not wise in your own eyes. Does this make thinking yourself to be wise sinful? What does wisdom look like in you? Can our flesh cloud the reality of whether we are wise or not? Interesting that the lack of the lacking of nothing could have a wide range of things one could be lacking of. A wider range of imperfections, blemishes, weaknesses. Yet the solution that God, who is so wise and never gets it wrong, is informing us about is the same for all of them. A single antidote. Gain wisdom. Wisdom from God. Which when you think about it honestly is exactly how it should be. After all, he says, be holy as I am holy. Could it be that gaining this godly wisdom, that it would have such an enormous impact on our holiness? So let's just run over the process again, just to make sure we see it in its full light. Be joyful, feel blessed, while being tested, while having your faith tried, because it's for your good. Recognize this. And it might take a while to get over this harsh reality. It produces patience, which is often waiting on God and others but also patience to not just do what we want to, which is unholy. Patience brings about godly character, resulting in us being perfected, entire, lacking nothing. Remember that ultimately we will only be completely perfected in the kingdom of God when Jesus returns. So it's a marathon, brethren. Could take your whole life. Brethren, remember this about yourselves. Don't get demoralized or cast down in your failings. Remember, you are trying, and God will finish the good work that he started in each one of you. This is something that has a huge bearing on enduring to the end. Don't give up trying. But also remember, brethren, that each one of you around you is in the same fight. This is why part of holiness is to encourage each other, to lift each other up, rather than knock each other down. And what of those who run the marathon well, who don't give up, who don't turn back to Egypt, who don't fall down, without getting back up. Well, James 1.12 tells us, just a few lines further down in the chapter, it says, Blessed is the one who endures, being put to the proof, tested. Enduring is facing the music. Hanging in there, taking your stripes with the boldness that Christ had, denying and resisting the ways of the flesh more and more. Because having been approved, passing the test, they will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Note all that is going on in this small piece of scripture. God promising the crown of life to those who endure to the end, and those who endure to the end are seen to be the ones that love him. By the fruit of enduring testing, which is obedience. Because if you love him, you will obey him. So how do we know if we are on the right path, in the right race? 
There is a big difference between a 100-meter sprint and a lifelong marathon. You began so well. What happened? What did you allow to cause you to be derailed? What is it that hinders? Hinders you from spending time with me to gain this wisdom you so desperately need and need to ask for. But how shall they understand lest they ask? At Matthew 24, verse 13, we read, But he who endures to the end, the same shall be kept safe. How will it be that we are kept safe? Could it be by grace? How much grace do we need? Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be open to you. Come in and spend some time with me because we might not have eternity together. The simple answer is, are we lacking in any part of perfection? If so, then it's a safe bet we are not wise enough. Last time I spoke, we looked into Galatians 5, 16 to 26. One of the many main points being that we are told to live by the Spirit so that we will never fulfill the desires of the flesh. What desires of the flesh are ruling in us? Are we slaves to? What relationship exists between growing in wisdom and living by His Spirit, being but guided by the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, taking every thought captive before it becomes action and rules us? What does it look like to have this spiritual radar on and working in our lives? How many facets, parts of our lives, will this spiritual radar be working in and impacting on? Military commanders have for many thousands of years known of the benefits of early warning, early detection. Doctors go on about how early detection is paramount in healing and recovery. Why? Because reversing damage is often not achievable. Hence why radar and imaging was developed. It highlights and pinpoints potential threats, identifies where they need to concentrate their efforts and response. In this part of scripture, there is a long list mentioned of imperfections, blemishes and weaknesses, which are acts of sin, ranging from those that are quickly identified as terrible and ab ab abhorrent, to some that might not make it onto our own personal judgment list when considering our own thoughts and actions. But there is a group of words in this list that brings in a need of understanding and wisdom we might not have. And things like that. All ending in the same outcome. Not making it into the presence of God, His kingdom, and living forever. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. No place for fit sitting, in or out, dead or alive, sheep or goats. All thrown into the same lack of faith, lack of wisdom, lack of endurance, lack of being entire, lack of being one in its full potential, lack of love. Remember the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all, and your neighbor as yourself. And remember what Paul said, having done all. And here is where wisdom plays a vital role. As a person thinks, so are they. What thoughts are we not capturing which turn into action? Are they things like that? Are they void of love for God and neighbor? If so, discern for yourself. Would this result in not inheriting the kingdom? If our thinking is not godly wise, if we are not growing in godly wisdom, if the level of our godly wisdom is low, then our level of personal acceptance of our own sinful actions within ourselves will also be low. Conformed to the way that the world thinks, carnal. We can so quickly and so easily see the faults or weaknesses in others, even to the point of searching them out and highlighting them. So clearly we have the ability to find fault. We are experts at this. Our radar is functioning well just maybe not aimed where our real enemy is, within. But when going through the list in reflection of ourselves, lacking in expertise at this self-examination is common. Are we ignorant or seared to seeing all of these in the same light, same outcome? Clearly these are weaknesses in the flesh, sin, and some obviously worse than others. But even those that would seem less serious are weaknesses, are sin. Maybe we might, we might not say within our own carnal hearts, rivalry is not so bad, or that like, or being quarrelsome, or that like, having hatred for others, or that like, having the odd wild party, or the like, or getting drunk the odd time, or the like, is not too bad. After all, I don't do these things often, 
only every now and then. Surely I won't die, especially as long as I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be sexually immoral. I don't want to be impure, jealous, quarrelsome, a drunk. I don't want to throw too many wild parties, only one every now and then. I don't want to be divisive, uncaring, unloving. Unrelated to the things and the progress of the kingdom or the like. I just can't help myself. It's my nature. Who shall save me? A wretched man, a wretched person that we are. Lord, help my unbelief. Help my thinking. To those that believe all things are possible. Another list is proposed a wee bit further down in Galatians 5. This list would help us to see our progress, to see the direction of the path and the marathon God wants us to be advancing in. Our growth in wisdom, how our race is going, how our endurance is working out, the things that we could be lacking in, the things that we would want to be getting better at, especially if we claim to love God and are called according to His purpose and not staying stuck in our own purposes, our own thinking. Would you claim to love God? If so, how much? Versus how much is needed to hear those amazing words, Come in, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What do you reckon your chances are? Should we even be reckoning what are our chances? In our recent Bible study, we got to verse 14 of Hebrews 12, which the sense of the word is this, that we, every one of us, myself as chief, are to fervently, with great effort, pursue earnestly peace with every man, friend or foe, and in holiness, showing the love, without which no one will end up with God in his kingdom forever. Think about this, this picture. Jesus returns, and you've been dead for a while now. You get resurrected, and you're thinking, sweet, it's all good. I died in faith. But the angel starts beating you, and you're informed for the mere small blemish of not pursuing peace with all men, you've been found guilty, and you have been separated from the sheep. You're in the goat pen, who you thought you were. We read this about the final judgment in Matthew 25. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all, and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory, and all nations shall be gathered before him. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And indeed, he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats off to the left. Then the king shall say to those on his right hand, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king shall answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you have done it to me. Then also he shall say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he shall answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do this for the, for the least of my brethren, you did not do this for me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Scripture tells us that those who are more responsible, those who have been given more, will be beaten with many more beatings than those with less responsibility. We know that the fruit of the Spirit is really important. Everyone would agree. But please don't ask me, 
because then I'm more responsible. But do our actions around the fruit demonstrate our faith? When we say fruit in or of the Spirit is important, do we see the importance of this statement by action? Remember, faith without works is death. Are we towards everyone, including ourselves, friend or foe, friend in Christ or enemy in Christ, are we loving, are we joyful for each other? And does joy abound in us, peaceful towards each other, long-suffering with each other, kind to each other, remembering that how we treat the brethren and all, the, and all men is, the, is one of the measures that Jesus will use to prove if we are sheep or goats. If we are knowingly choosing to act differently to this list, then we are lacking in wisdom. Are we goats masquerading in sheep's clothing? James 4, 4 4-5 says this, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship of the world, fulfilling the desires of your flesh, is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever desires to be a friend of the world, fulfilling the desires of your flesh, is the enemy of God. Do you think that Scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us yearns to envy? Here we are told that the Spirit of God is at work in us, and it yearns to envy. It has power in us. It desirously yearns and pushes us to being spiritually led, while our flesh nature is trying to do the opposite, to hinder. They are opposed to each other, conflicting, arguing, fighting, and warring, trying to occupy the high ground on the battlefield of our minds. Some fairly heavy and severe labels are allocated in Scripture at times, usually when there is much to be gained or lost. Those who are friends with the world, and we are taught that they are the ones who practice the things of the world, are labored adulterers and adulteresses. When I looked into the Greek for this indictment, it said, especially the forbidden partner of a married person, a cheat. So what are the things of the world that adulterers practice in? They should be obvious to us, as the word says, they are obvious. Adulterers practice in sexual immorality, impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of anger, quarrels, conflicts, factions, envy, murder, drunkenness, and wild partying, and things like that. With such a wide range of conducts being associated with adultery and the lack of wisdom, no wonder God asks, no wonder God says, ask of him, and no wonder he says, I will give liberally and without reproach. God says that he will give us the desires of our hearts. And he says that he does all things. What does our heart genuinely pine for, long for? Is it the things of God? Then God will give us these things. He will finish the good work he begun in us. But if our desires are still carnal, still in the and like these basket, then our hearts will be given over to those things, which whatever they are even the things like that. If so, then asking for wisdom should be a regular request. Remember the woman from Canaan whose daughter was vexed with a demon, vexed with a problem of the mind. She asked for healing from Jesus for her daughter. But Jesus' initial response, go away. I am not sent but to the house of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yet she pleaded all the more and eventually received what she asked for and then commended for her faith. So asking for wisdom probably wants to come off the bucket list, I'll get to it at some point before I die, onto the regular list. When God says he will give liberally, it speaks of great action. Another word could be giving lavishly, laying it on thick. Without reproach, this tells us this lavish, laying it on thick giving of godly wisdom will take place without looking at our previous foolish choices. What great mercy! Be ye holy as I am holy. Be merciful as I am merciful. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive each other. Lord, I do forgive and show mercy. Help my unmerciful, unforgiving, unloving heart. If so much authority is represented here, God says, and it shall be given to you, but ask in faith, doubting nothing. For those who doubt are like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For do not let that person think, as a man thinks, that they shall receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded. 
not dependable in all of their ways. At Mark 9, 23 to 24, we read, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out in desperation and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Do we not ask and not receive because we secretly don't believe, secretly don't want to change? We're happy to stay the same because if we did want to change and become wiser, we would ask and receive. Therefore, guilty as charged, not dependable in every way. And who is the way? The one who was, is, and shall be dependable in every way. The one who this desperate man with tears in his eyes cried out to, Abba, Father, through the Son, through the shepherd of the sheep. He wasn't asking for himself. He was asking for another, one who he loved deeply. So many questions about wisdom could come to mind, but maybe don't. Some that we would probably think we can answer fairly well straight off the bat. Is this true? Are we well enough healed in regard to wisdom? What is wisdom? How would you describe it? How should you understand it? Can we teach it? More importantly, can we be taught it? And if so, what could hinder us from receiving this great gift from our Father? Why does our Father want us to ask for it? It is a good gift. Do we need more wisdom? What are the benefits of growing in wisdom? And what are the outworkings in our lives of having more wisdom? Well, further down in James 1 at verse 17, we are taught, Every good gift and every perfect gift, lacking nothing, is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. No coincidence here that in the same book and chapter, only a few verses apart, is a theme being demonstrated that to be perfected and lacking in nothing, we need wisdom. And that this wisdom makes up a part of the many good gifts that we can ask for, that the Father of lights can send down to us. But wisdom is needed. It's a need. We need this. God, you know without it, no flesh will survive. And has God not taught us that he will take care of all of our needs? It would seem that taking care of the need of wisdom can have degrees or levels that God, in his wisdom, would start us out with, and not all the wisdom we need. Sounds a bit like faith. I give you a deposit, a measure of faith. What you do with wisdom and faith is on you. I am the start and the finishing of your faith. I am the start and the finishing of your wisdom. Is not working out our own lack and then asking for help not essentially being wise? And the opposite of this, the opposite of being wise, is it not being unmindful? But how do we know if we are lacking towards perfection in every good work? The key could be in the light, the light of the Father. Does the light that our Father lavishes on us shine out from us? Do we hoard this light? Do we hinder this light? Light purifies and edifies. Are we an edifying tool in the army of God? Wisdom is often considered a quality because it embodies a set of features, behaviors and awareness that allow us to make thoughtful and sound decisions, to think better and more in line with the teachings of our Father. Unlike knowledge, which involves information and facts, black and white, cold, wisdom involves the ability to apply that knowledge in a practical, ethical and beneficial way, warm and loving. It can be seen as a combination of experience, reflection and judgment that leads to good decision making and understanding in various situations various tests and various trials. So it would seem that wisdom can be a real jewel to possess. But could it be that it is made up of many jewels? And if so, how would one set these jewels in our lives? What place would we give to them? We read at Proverbs 4 verse 9, Wisdom shall give to your hand an ornament of grace. Let's see what this ornament of grace is. Wisdom shall shield you with a crown of glory. Here we are reading how beneficial wisdom is, that it can shield us with a crown of glory and grace. Wisdom offers protection from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Crowns are given to rulers. We are taught to rule over our hearts and minds, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Crowns often have many jewels set in the soft gold metal. Are we soft gold? Where Jesus can place jewels, or are we hard of heart? Let's look at some of the jewels that wisdom can be 
in, to, and through each of us. One of the jewels could be deep understanding. Wisdom can be described as a deep understanding of life, human nature, and the world. It goes beyond knowledge or intelligence, encompassing insight into the complexities of existence, the how, the why. When we say someone has the quality of wisdom, we mean they can see beyond the surface, thinking and making decisions based on a holistic view of situations. We read at Proverbs 2 verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, and out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Another jewel could be judgment and discernment. Wisdom involves sound judgment and the ability to discern the best course of action, especially in challenging or ambiguous circumstances. It's the quality that helps a person weigh options, consider long-term consequences, and navigate complexities with balance and fairness. We read at Proverbs 3, 5-6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Another jewel could be Emotional balance and perspective. Wise individuals typically exhibit emotional intelligence, knowing how to regulate their emotions and understand others. They have the quality of patience, self-control, and empathy. These qualities allow them to remain calm in adversity and to offer perspective when others are caught up in the emotion or impulsivity. Proverbs 16 verse 32 reads this, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. James 3, 13 to 18. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. How do we make peace? Who should we make peace with? Who needs peace? What part of the house of Jesus should the righteousness of peace not be sown in? Another jewel could be experience and reflection. Wisdom is often cultivated through experience and reflection. The more life experience one gains, particularly if they reflect on past mistakes and successes, the greater the wisdom they may develop. In this sense, wisdom as a quality is linked to the ability to learn and adapt over time. 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Is it just too hard to look, think about our experiences? Are we that lazy or hindered to reflect on them, on them ourselves? Another jewel could be ethical integrity. Wisdom is often tied to a strong moral, ethical framework. It's not just about knowing what works, but also understanding what is right or good. Wise people tend to demonstrate integrity alongside humility and fairness, which are all qualities that align with moral wisdom. Ethics are principles that guide behavior, while integrity suggests that we should carry out ethical principles in our daily lives and activities, rather than espousing an ideal and then doing something contradictory. The story of my life, I heard the hearts of believers say, Another jewel could be adaptability and open-mindedness. A wise person tends to possess the quality of adaptability. They recognize that life is constantly changing and that rigid thinking may limit understanding. Their open-mindedness allows them to consider new ideas, revise their views, and adapt when and if necessary. Remember our Lord changeth not. He doesn't need to. He is perfect, holy, without blemish. But as he confronts us with the ugly truth of who we are, due to the sin that lies within us, due to the way that we think, we need to take the way of escape far more regularly, aiming for and having an attitude of pleasing our Lord, so that that which we are faithful in shall be increased, watering the flower that we are. 
We're finishing with this, a living sacrifice, Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to prove by you what is that good and pleasing and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to every one who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but set your mind to be right-minded, even as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For even as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function, so we the many are one body in Christ, and each one members of one another. Then having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, if prophecy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry in the ministry, or he who teaches in teaching, or he who exhorts in the encouragement, or he who shares in simplicity, or he who takes the lead in diligence, or he who shows mercy in cheerfulness. Marks of the true Christian. Let love be without hypocrisy, shrinking from evil, cleaving to good, in brotherly love to one another, <coughs> loving fervently, having led one another in honour, as to diligence not slothful, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in affliction, steadfastly continuing in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, pursuing hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with rejoicing ones and weep with weeping ones, minding the same thing towards one another, not minding high things, but yielding to the lowly. Do not be wise within yourselves. Repay no one evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as far as it is in you, being in peace with all men, not avenging yourselves, beloved, but giving place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Brethren, let's aim for full marks. Thank you.